So today's speaker is Jarek Kopinski from CFT, and he will speak about applications of tractor calculus in general relativity. Okay, thank you for the introduction. As mentioned, the title of this lecture series is Applications of Tractor Calculus in GR, and the, the plan is as follows. So I'll start with introducing some basic notions from tractor calculus. In particular, I will talk about a way in which tractor calculus can be uh, applied in the study of conformal infinities, which is a very useful concept from the perspective of GR. And then I'll move to the second part, which is about uh, space times with prescribed asymptotic uh, behavior to the future and to the past. So I will start with asymptotically the sitter space times and talk about the way in which their end state can be characterized in terms of uh, constraints relating the geometry of uh, future infinity with the, uh, the stress energy tensor. Then I'll move to space time with initial isotropic singularities and explore the, the geometric implications of the assumption that space time possess such uh, initial singularity. And again, try to characterize this time the initial state uh, with respect to constraints relating the geometry of initial hypersurface with the matter content of such space time. So those two points will lead me naturally to the last part, which is part about conformal cyclic cosmology. So here I'll present a general way of uh, constructing a, a CCC scenario where you want to identify the end state of asymptotically the sitter space time with the initial state of space-time with uh, isotropic singularity. So those, those lecture series are mainly best based on three papers. The first one is an introductionary paper by Sean Curry and Rob Gover, uh, introductionary paper to conformal geometry and tractor calculus. And the second and third one are my papers with Roth and Andrew Waldron about asymptotically the sitter space-times and space-times with uh, initial isotropic singularity, where the last one is still in preparation, but should appear on our height in the foreseeable future. Okay, before we dive right into the subject, something about notation and conventions that I'm going to use. So I'll work with Lorentzian and dimensional manifolds and sometimes specify myself to four dimensions. And the metric or, or the conformal class will have signature n minus one, one. Uh, I will use uh, abstract index notation and denote various bundles by calligraphic E. So for example, the tangent bundle is E with superscript and cotangent bundle is E with subscript. So for example, a metric uh, is a section of a bundle of symmetric two tensors as visible here, where I use this fairly standard notion of symmetrization bracket and there is also a notion of anti-symmetrization bracket and they are visible in equations one. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about objects of two types, uh, tensors and tractors, and in order to distinguish between them in the abstract index notation, I will use lowercase letters for tensorial labels and uppercase letters for tractorial labels. Uh, the Levitch Vita the notation for Levitch Vita connection is a nabla, and the, the, this connection with respect to some metric G is characterized by the condition that it's metric compatible, as in two, and torsion three, uh, as in equation three, where gammas are, are Christopher symbols. This connection uh, can be used in the standard definition of Riemann tensor, where you apply two, two derivatives to some one form V commute them and that's your Riemann tensor. That's how Riemann tensor appears. That's on the right hand side of equation four. Uh, but from the perspective of conformal geometry, it is more convenient to, to talk about the decomposition of the, uh, the, the decomposition of Riemann tensor instead of full Riemann tensor. So we have its fully trace-free part, which is the vial tensor W, that's the first term on the right hand side of five and the trace part, which is usually Ricci tensor. But since, as I said, we're in a, a world of conformal geometry, it's better to talk about trace corrected Ricci tensor, which is called the Scouten tensor and defined by 
uh, denoted by P and defined in equation six. Okay, so before I go into conformal geometry, let's do some warm up and consider simple conformal transformations. So let's say that we have a second metric G hat, which is related to the uh, previous one G by, by a conformal transformation with conformal factor omega squared. And let me define psi, denote psi by derivative of logarithm of the uh, uh, conformal factor omega. Then uh, we can relate a uh, connection associated to G hat, which is nabla hat with the connection associated to G nabla uh, via standard uh, rule, conformal transformation rule visible in seven. So for example, we see that if we take seven and uh, take anti fully anti-symmetric part of seven, that expression will be conformally invariant uh, as in equation eight, but that's a obvious statement. Uh, more interesting uh, case is when we consider divergence of anti-symmetric two tensor F. So we write the divergence with respect to G hat, uh, as <clears throat> as divergent with respect to G, and that's equation nine. So we see that if we're in dimension four, then the second part, the second term from the right hand side of nine is gone, and we we get a statement that divergence is conformally covariant in this dimension because there is an over there will still be an overall factor of one over omega squared. Okay, the last example, which is most closely related to what I'm, what I'm about to talk in a minute is the conformal wave operator. So here we want to consider the action of a Laplacian on a function. And again, using standard conformal transformation rules, the Laplacian with respect to metric G hat can be expressed as a Laplacian corresponding to G and sometimes with Psi uh, as an 11. And now to make a conformally covariant or invariant expression uh, based on 11, I'm gonna do a certain trick. And the trick is that I'm going to assume that uh, there, uh, there is a conformal transformation rule that the function also conformally transforms when the metric transforms. So I will assume that there is a second function F hat corresponding to metric G hat such that the <clears throat> F hat is related to F uh, with omega, omega to power one minus N over two. So then if we, do, if we assume it and add some lower order curv uh, curvature corrections, we can construct a conformally covariant operator from Laplacian. And that's our equation Y, that's our, our operator Y from 13. And it's conformally invariant in a sense that if y corresponding to metric g hat so y hat acts on our rescaled function f hat then this can be expressed as the action of y on f with the overall factor of omega 2 minus 1 minus n over 2 as in as is visible in equation 14. Uh, one more thing. Okay, so the, the conformal transformation rules for the parts of the Riemann tensor are visible in 15. So uh, the vial tensor with one index upstairs is conformally invariant, and the skeleton uh, tensor has a fairly simple conformal transformation rule visible in the second equation in 15. So, for example, if you want to construct a simple conformally covariant scalar from Value tensor, we can just take two value tensors, contract every index, and that's uh, this, this scalar field will be conformally covariant with the factor one over omega to six, as in, as in 16. Uh, so now we can ask ourselves a question is a, what's a or is there a generic way to construct conformally conformally invariant uh, tensors or covariant or invariant tensors and conformally covariant and invariant operators? And a brute force answer to this question is, of course, there is because we can just take, let's say, curvature, apply some 
derivative operators are lower order terms to make everything conformally covariant and or invariant and that's our uh, that's that's one of that, that was the answer to the question and i think that's how the bach tensor which is the second derivative of scout and tensor plus some lower order curvature correction terms uh, appeared in, a, in the first place so the, the definition of bach tensor is visible in 17 and the its conformal transformation rule uh, is as in 18. So we see that in four dimensions, the Bach tensor is conformal in covariant because there is a, it tra just transforms with the factor of one over omega squared. Okay, but that's this brute force approach is uh, of construction of conformal invariance is definitely not the optimal way. And I, I want to argue today that the optimal way is through the, the use of tractor calculus. But before we go into tractor calculus, let's do some conf simple conformal geometry first. So from now on, I'm going to assume that instead of a manifold with a metric G, I'll have a manifold with a conformal class uh, denoted here by C. Uh, which can be characterized by the condition that if two metrics g and g hat are in the conformal class then at each point x of my manifold uh, those two metrics are related to each other by a positive free scaling by uh, parameter s squared so we can view our conformal class as a raised sub bundle of a bundle of symmetric two tensors or alternatively as a principal R plus bundle with the projection pi and the principal action parameterized by parameter S and uh, visible in 21. So this principal action uh, is just given by rescaling of the metric by S squared. So now our conformal class can be used in the definition of bundle of conformal densities of weight W. Uh, denoted by E of W. So this, uh, this bundle arises uh, as an associated bundle to the conformal class Q with respect to the action of R plus on the real line. And a section of this bundle can be identified with a function F which goes from conformal class to the real line such that if we move around a fiber of the conformal class then the function f rescales with our parameter s to omega as in 23. Uh, so in order to make this uh, simpler we can now take two metrics from the conformal class g and g hat and uh, with the usual conformal transformation rule with with omega squared and pull back our function f by those two sections and if we do it then what we'll get is two functions f and f hat such that the, <clears throat> they are conformally related with the conformal factor omega to w so with this definition at hand i can now say that my conformal wave operator or the yamabi operator in riemannian geometry is an operator on the bundle of conformal densities of weight one minus n over two because the trick that I used to uh, define the conformal wave operator was to assume that, uh, that we have uh, that the function scales uh, with the metric with the with omega to precisely this power one minus n over two. Okay, so this definition of bundle of conformal densities can be seamlessly extended to the bundle of conformally weighted tensors with the use of tensor product. So from now on. Apart from conformal scalar, weighted conformal scalars, I can also talk about uh, the conformally weighted tensors. And the principal example of a conformally weighted tensor is the conformal metric, which arises as a topological inclusion of conformal class in the pullback of a bundle of symmetric two tensors. And this topological inclusion is visible in 25. So it can be identified with a canonical section both G, which is the conformal metric, and it's a section of bundle of symmetric two tensors of weight two. So now with the, with the definition of conformal metric at hand, we can uh, characterize each metric from the conformal class by the 
uh, weight one function or weight one scale sigma corresponding to this metric denoted here by sigma g because the metric where there's the, the conformal metric multiplied by one over sigma squared uh, defines a sum metric from the conformal class because from the simple uh, adding the weights we see that the right hand side of 26 has weight zero so it's a bona fide metric and this scale sigma corresponding to metric has a nice 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 property that the corresponding function sigma tilde uh, on, on on conformal class takes value one along the section uh, defined section g a section uh, corresponding to the metric g okay so there's also a notion of connection uh, induced by the the scale sigma or the metric from the conformal class uh, and the action of such connection on some conformally weighted color tau uh, is visible in 27. so we see that the the object that this the partial derivative acts on on the right hand side of 27 has weight zero so this definition is self-consistent and of course, there is a there is an immediate generalization uh, to the, the action of this connection of, of weighted tensor bundles, uh, because if we want this connection to act on tensor bundles, then you will have some terms with Christopher symbols on the right hand side of twenty seven instead of just the partial derivative. So the two immediate consequences of this definition is that. Uh, firstly, the scale corresponding to a metric uh, is annihilated by the connection uh, associated with the same scale or the same metric, and that's 28. Uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, an immediate consequence of definition 27. So secondly, the conformal metric is annihilated by every, but by connection associated to every metric from the conformal class, as in 29. So now, so the consequence of 29 is that we can now use the conformal metric both G or instead of some metric from the conformal class to, to, to raise and lower indices in, in every formula. Uh, now the conformal transformation rule of the, uh, the, the connection induced by scale is fairly simple. So, if we assume again that we have two metrics g and g hat with the conformal rescaling by omega squared then the connection associated with g hat uh, can be expressed by connection associated to g and the term with the weight w and psi which was the, the derivative of the logarithm of conformal factor omega as in 30. Okay, so a step towards tractor calculus. So right from now on, I'm gonna assume that my conformal class has an Einstein metric in it, and I will denote this Einstein metric by G hat. So here the Einstein means that the Ricci tensor is proportional to the metric with the proportionality factor lambda constant because of the Bianchi identities. But it's more convenient to work with alternative condition to 31. So, uh, so the condition that the uh, that, that the, the Ricci ten that the trace free Ricci tensor of G hat is zero, or because I introduced the skeleton tensor before that the trace free skeleton tensor of G hat is zero, and that's my condition 32. So now what I want to do is I want to write uh, 32 in terms of some other metric from the conformal class G, which is again related with G hat with, uh, with the conformal factor omega squared. And that's my equation 33, where we have the, the derivative of uh, our friend Psi and some term with the metric, which is not relevant right now. Uh, so now the goal is to, to rewrite 33 with the use of this machinery of scales and connection induced by scales. And the first step to do that is to assume that uh, there is a scale sigma g hat corresponding to, to the metric g hat as in 34. 
And uh, if we observe that the conformal factor relating G and G hat omega can be written as a quotient of the scale corresponding to G uh, and the scale corresponding to G hat, then uh, we can observe that a second, a Hessian of the scale uh, sigma G hat can be written in uh, is just proportional to the second and third term from the, from the left hand side of 33. So we can, as an equation, as a visible in equation 35. So we can now take 35, plug it into 33. And what we'll get is the <clears throat> equation 36, where the operator A uh, is visible in 37. So now it can be checked that this operator is, uh, is conformal invariant because it, it acts from the bundle of weight one scales to the bundle of uh, symmetric trace free two tensors of weight one. And as a sanity check, we can verify whether we can start from 36 and recover the condition that we started with, i.e. the condition that the trace free skeleton tensor of metric G hat is zero. But this can be done easily because we can not just evaluate equation 36 in, in the scale G hat, use the condition that the scale is annihilated by the connection in, induced by the scale. And what, what's left from uh, 36 are those the terms with the scout and tensor and its trace. So in the end, if we do, if we evaluate this equation in the scale G hat, what's left from it is uh, the left the, the is equation thirty nine, which is precisely the equation that we started with, i.e., the trace free skeleton tensor of metric G hat is a zero. Okay, so now a little uh, renaming of variables. Uh, so. Equation 40 is again my, my conformal to Einstein equations, but, but I absorb trace terms by uh, my new variable rho, which is now uh, uh, conformal weight minus one conformal scalar. And because uh, the scale sigma from equation 40 is not a positive scale, it's more convenient to call this equation almost Einstein equation instead of conformal to Einstein equation because. If we really want this equation to give rise to a metric, we should assume that sigma is a positive weight one scale. But since we're not assuming that, I'm going to, I'm going to call this equation almost Einstein equation. And this AE equation is a uh, <clears throat> is a first step in the in, in introducing the tractor bundle. But uh, in order to do it, I need to do I need to prolong this equation. I.e., instead of uh, looking at second order second order equation for some scale sigma as in forty, I want to rewrite uh, rewrite this equation as a system of first order equation. Uh, in order to do it, I'm going to uh, I, I need to introduce new variable mu a, which is a section of uh, uh, one forms of weight one. So that mu a is just a derivative of sigma as in 41. So if we now use 41 in AE equation, then this, 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 this equation will uh, have the form visible in 42. So the last step to, to fully rewrite 40 in a, as a system of first order equation is to derive an equation for my, for my variable rho but that's fairly easy. So you just apply a derivative to 42, commute the derivatives, use Bianchi identities, and what we'll get is, what we get is equation 43. So what I did here on this slide is I started from a second order equation for some weight one scale sigma 40, and I rewritten it in, in, as a system of first order equations 41, 42 and 43 for variables sigma, mu, and rho. And this, this triple of variables sigma, mu, and rho is a, uh, is a, is a representative uh, of the, uh, of the of something which can be called pretractor bundle because I can now define 
a pre-tractor bundle as a pair consisting of a direct sum bundle and a metric from the conformal class. When this direct sum bundle consists of a scalar of weight one, one, uh, one form of weight one, and another scalar of weight minus one. So this, so my variable sigma mu and rho fits into uh, this description. And because I just did, uh, I, I use those three variables uh, those three variables appeared from the almost Einstein equation. I have I also have a connection induced on my pretractor bundle given by this first order system and visible here in 45. So an immediate consequence is that uh, if there are parallel sections of my my pretractor connection nabla t, then there are solutions of the almost Einstein equation. Uh -huh. Okay, one more thing to, to promote my pre-tractor bundle to the full tractor bundle is uh, to look at the conformal transformation rule for my, my variables. But that's, that can be done if we recall the original definitions of variables mu and rho. So mu, uh, mu was a derivative of sigma and rho was uh, the trace part in the AE equation, so visible uh, in 46. So we can just say that, uh, we can just look at the right-hand sides of 46 and use the, uh, use the conformal transformation rule for the, the connection uh, induced by the metric to declare what are the conformal transformation rules for my variables mu and rho. So if we call the, uh, the, right, the conformal transformation rule for, for, for the connection acting on weight one scale was uh, as visible in equation 47 and the conformal transformation rule for the right hand side of rho can be just derived from 47 and that's, that's equation 48. So in the end, we can use 47 and 48 to decree that uh, the conformal transformation rules for my variables mu and rho are just as uh, in equation 49, which, uh, and, and the conformal transformation rule for sigma is trivial because this sigma is, as, is, is a weight one, is just a weight one scale. So equations 49 can be now written in the matrix form to see that this transformation is given by a group action which in turn defines the equivalence relation between two triples, sigma hat, mu hat, rho hat, and sigma mu and rho uh, to promote the pretractor bundle, the full tractor bundle, which can now be defined as a sum of all pretractor bundles over the metrics, over the, on, the every metric from the conformal class, quotient by this equivalence relation defined by the group action fit. And that will be my, my tractor bundle. Uh, so because there was a there was a connection on each tractor bundle, we also have a connection on my on the full tractor bundle. Uh, because we can use the same argument with quotient uh, with the quotient by the group action to, to promote the, the connection from the pre-tractor bundle to the connection on the full tractor bundle. Okay, so now similarly to the Riemannian geometry, there is also a metric on the, the tractor bundle, which can be defined by the map 52 and polarization formula. So this metric, uh, I'll denote this metric by H, and it can be checked that uh, metric H is preserved by the, the tractor connection. And just like in Riemannian geometry, we can use it to uh, move the tractorial indices up and down as visible in 53. And there, oh, there is also a notion of a tractor curvature. So following the definition of Riemann tensor, we can apply two, two tractor connections to a tractor V, commute them, and that's the definition of tractor curvature kappa. Uh, that's 54. And because the, the tractor metric is annihilated by tractor curvature, the, the, the tractor connection has similar um, has similar symmetries to the Riemann tensor, i.e. it's anti-symmetric in both pair of, uh, pair of indices uh, as visible in 55.
So if we evaluate the tractor curvature in some scale G, then it has a form visible on the right hand side of 56, where A is, a, is an anti-symmetry anti-symmetric derivative of the Cotton tensor, which is of the Scouten tensor, which is called the, the Cotton tensor. And a, a particular uh, so we, by looking at the, 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 the form of the tractor, tractor curvature, we see that if, it's, if this, this, this tractor is zero, then uh, the vowel tensor vanishes, which means that our conformally, uh, conformal structure is conformally flat, which is the a similar statement to the statement that if Riemann tensor in Riemannian geometry is zero, then we have a, a flat, uh, flat manifold. Okay, so <clears throat> apart from the, the uh, tractor connection, there is also another differential operator which is uh, important from the perspective of tractors, and that's uh, Thomas D operator. So this is a differential operator which, uh, uh, which, in, as opposed to the tractor connection, can act on track on the weighted tractors and not on a, on a, on a, on a tractors of weight zero. And the form of this, the, the Thomas D operator when acting on some tractor V is visible in 57. So we see that this is a second order differential operator that can, that can act on tractors of any weight. And uh, can we check that it really transforms this, this right hand side of 57 really transforms as an element as a section of the tractor number. So now this Thomas D operator can be used to define a very important tractor called the scale tractor associated to some scale sigma. And this, this tractor can be defined uh, if we just take some weight one scale sigma, apply Thomas D operator and divide by N. And uh, it can be used in the almost Einstein equation. It can be used to rewrite the almost Einstein equation in the form visible in a 59. So uh, if we if we do it, then we see that the almost Einstein equation, this the, the, the solution of the almost Einstein equation exists if there exists a parallel tractor I sigma. But a question arises: How do we? Let's say that we solve fifty nine. So how can we then recover the almost Einstein scale sigma from the the scale tractor I sigma? And here the, the tractor projectors come at hand because uh, we can introduce uh, okay, we can introduce tractor projectors y, z, and uh, x, y, x, y, and z, which can be thought of as basis elements in which every tractor can be decomposed. So, for example, if we have a tractor U, then it can be decomposed uh, with the use of those basis elements, as in sixty one. So there is also a simple, fairly simple decomposition of the tractor metric, and uh, <clears throat> and with those tractor projectors at hand, the scale can be recovered from the scale tractor just by contracting I sigma with the tractor projector X as visible in equation sixty two. Uh, the, another important thing regarding the, uh, the scale tractor I sigma is that if we compute its, its length squared, then we'll, we arrive at the right, in some scale G, then we arrive at the right hand side of 63. So for example, if we evaluate, evaluate it in the scale induced by sigma and use the fact that the, sigma, that the scale is annihilated by the connection uh, associated to the scale, then what, what's left from the right-hand side of 63 is a trace of the Scouten tensor, which in turn can be written as a uh, Ricci scalar, uh, and that's the right-hand side of 64. So we see that the, <clears throat> the length of the scale tractor I sigma provides a conformally covariant notion of the scalar curvature. Uh, okay, and I think that's a good time to stop here because then uh, I want to move in now to the description of conformal infinities and that, that the scale tractor will play a very important role in that. But before I stop this lecture, 
let me provide a way to view uh, tractor calculus in a more geometric uh, way, not just not some abstract way based on almost Einstein uh, equation. And I'll do that based on a simplest example, which is the example of conformal sphere. So let's say that we have a Minkowski spacetime with the metric eta, and I want to consider the set of null vectors in this Minkowski spacetime. So that the set obviously form a, a null cone n, but I'm only going to need a half of this cone, so I can introduce a, a notion of time direction and just take a, a half of the cone which points to, towards the future, and I will call this half cone l n plus. So now there exists a map P plus, which uh, takes a, a null generator X of my future cone uh, to, to, the, to its equivalence class with respect to the equivalence relation given by rescaling by a positive factor alpha as in 65. So we see that the, the image of the whole future cone with respect to P plus is just uh, S2. And now, uh, if we consider a submersion P of future cone in S2, then each null generator of the future cone determines a positive definite metric on S2 via relation 68. So this metric induced by the null generator X uh, acting uh, on, on two vectors Y and Z on, uh, on S2 is given by the uh, the action of the, the ambient Minkowski metric eta on two vectors y prime and z prime, where y prime and z prime are lifts of the vectors y and z uh, from S2. And because uh, the, the two different lifts differ by a null vector, and by definition, null vector has length zero, then this definition 68 is independent. Uh, of the choice of the, the lifts y prime and z prime. And this relation is precisely what defines a conformal metric here, because now the conformal metric on S2 can be defined as a restriction of the, the ambient, met or ambient Minkowski metric eta to the tangent vector fields to the future con, which are lifts of the vector fields from, uh, from, a, from the sphere. But somewhat alternative way to see uh, the conformal metric here is based on the coordinate description on, of Minkowski space. So just to recall the uh, the metric eta written in, in the spherical coordinates uh, as the form visible in 69. And now if we write this metric in terms of null coordinates u and v, which are defined in, as in 70, then the metric will uh, have the form visible in 71. So now, since we want to restrict ourselves to the null cone, then uh, we can we can either we, we can just uh, assume that either u or v is a constant because that's that's a definition of this relation defines a null cone. And because without a loss of generality, I can, I can just assume that uh, I will work with null cone defined by the condition that V is zero. So by looking at 71, we see that the metric induced on null hypersurface V equals zero is degenerate because it has signature zero plus plus. But if we forget about this null direction or just quotient this by the null direction, then this, <clears throat> the restriction of the, metric induced on V equals zero hypersurface, hypersurface will have the form visible in 72, which is precisely the, the conformal metric induced on, on, on the sphere. Because the right-hand side of 72 is, is just a family of metrics on, on S2 parameterized by this other null, null coordinate U. So for example, when U is two corresponds to the standard run sphere metric. Okay, so that was the, the conformal metric, but how, how can we view tractors or tractor bundle or, or a section of tractor bundles here on this, this simplest example? Well, this uh, tractor bundle arises if we uh, uh, quotient the, the, the tangent space to the future cone by the equivalence relation defined by uh, visible here. So I'm going to declare decree that 
two, vec two tangent vectors to a future cone u and v are equivalent if they are attached to the same null generator and that they, when they are parallel to each other. So now if we look at the, uh, the tangent space to future cone and quotient it by the, this equivalence relation, then this gives rise to the, to the tractor bundle on, on the conformal sphere S2 with the conformal class uh, defined as, as, uh, as I did a minute ago. So uh, in other words, we can view we can view a section of this destructor bundle here on the on our on the simplest example of conformal sphere as visible here on the picture. So we have a, an equivalence of class of vectors which are attached to the same null generator and are parallel to each other. And that's our tractor in this picture. Okay, that's that's everything. Thank you for your attention.